Thank you. I wake up every single day with a clear sense of why I do what I do. I wake up every single day to inspire people to do what inspires them. And I imagine this world that's a little different to the one we live in now, in which the vast, vast, vast majority of people go home absolutely every single day fulfilled by the work that they do and wake up the next morning inspired to go to work. I completely devoted my life to this, to spreading this idea of living with purpose, to spreading this idea of building a company based on why and how those great leaders are the ones who start with why. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about losing your sense of purpose and losing your sense of why. In August of this year, I had a profound experience. I do a lot of work with the US military, and the general who runs Air Mobility Command asked me if I would be willing to go to Iraq or Afghanistan because he wanted me to see his men and women performing their missions. And so I agreed, and they sent me to Afghanistan. And I was really excited, and I was telling all my friends, I'm going to Afghanistan, isn't this going to be fun? And I'm going to be going on all these missions with the Air Force. And then as I got closer and closer to the date, I realized I'm going to a war zone. This is ridiculous. And then I went down to Dover Air Force Base, which is where my mission began. And I was fitted for my body armor. And they put the extra plates in for me so that it could stop a round of an AK-47. That was very kind of them. And that's when it dawned on me, what have I agreed to here? <laughs> but off I went. I flew on five missions in total. We left from Dover Air Force Base and flew on a big C-5, one of those huge big cargo planes, and we took a cargo mission to Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany. Almost all the missions that go into or out of the Middle East go through Ramstein, and that's where we started as well. On the ground at Ramstein for just a few hours, we then caught the next plane, which is a KC-135, traditionally used as a tanker, but now is being used as an aeromedical evacuation plane because we're running thin and we're having to use different planes to do different missions. KC-135 has no defensive measures on it. It is a tanker. And here we were flying into a war zone. When you're in a war zone, you have all the emotions you would spec expect to have. And I went through every emotion you'd expect to have, but I didn't have them all at the right time. Times where I should have been scared, I was totally, totally relaxed. And times that I should have been totally relaxed, I was petrified. I was freaking out four hours before we landed. But when we did land, flying into Bagram, I was fine. The big door on the side of the plane opened, and 10 minutes after we had landed, the base came under a rocket attack. We heard it land. You sort of hear the poof. There was no mistaking what it was. All the sirens start blaring and I've been on the ground a total of 10 minutes. You're supposed to put on your vest and your helmet, but we didn't bother because we're standing on a plane filled with gas, and if we get hit, ain't no vest going to do any good. And so we stood there and waited. We were all relaxed, including me. There was no bravado. We were just relaxed. I don't know why, but we were. We finally got permission to get off the aircraft, and we went to our housing, and we were told to stay put because the all-clear had still not been given. And we carried our body armor to our, to our place where we had to spend the night. We slept for about two and a half, three hours, and then went on to our next mission. The objective was to spend time in theater to fly on an, aer uh, to fly on an airdrop mission, but we don't know when they were going to happen. And so the goal was to stay in country about 30 hours, up to 30 hours, waiting to get on a mission. And then once we completed our mission, we'd get, we get out of there. One of the things you have to understand, that this is a busy place, and I'm a visitor. And they go out of their way to make me feel welcome and look after me, and I'm distracting them from their job, and I feel like I'm in the way. So the quicker we can get out of there, the better. As it turned out, we were able to get on an airdrop mission very quickly. We slept for about two or three hours and left early in the morning to go on the airdrop mission, and it was wonderful. We took a C-17 out, we flew for about an hour, dropped the plane down to about 2,000 feet, the back door opens, we're sitting there, and all of this cargo with parachutes slides out the back, and we delivered fuel, ammunition, and water to a forward operating base run by the Army. And then we flew back. Now the goal was to get out of there. We've done our airdrop mission. Let's get out of country. And so we managed to get on an aeromedical mission. This is when they take wounded warriors, wounded soldiers, and they get them out quickly. And the plane is filled with stretchers. 
And so it's up to the discretion of the captain of the aircraft whether we can join his mission. So we approached him and said, can you get three of us on here? It's me and my two escorts. And he said, I need you to hold on for a while. And so we waited and waited and waited and waited. And eventually he said, you're on the plane. And then we waited and waited and waited and waited, maybe for about two hours, two and a half hours, until the mission would get going. Five minutes before we're about to leave, we're sitting on the plane, we're ready to go, and the captain walks up and says, I gotta bump you guys. We need more room for patience. And if there's ever a reason to get bumped off an aircraft, that's a good one. And so we got off the plane and tried to go and find another mission that we can get out of there. And that's when we found out that the next aircraft leading, leaving the country would be leaving on Tuesday. This was Saturday. I was now stuck in Afghanistan for at least four days, and there was no guarantee that we were going to get on any flight on Tuesday. I didn't tell my parents or my family that I was going to Afghanistan because I didn't want them to worry, because there was no way I could communicate with them while I was there, so what was the point of telling them? I told them I was going to Germany, that was true. I just didn't tell them I'd continue going on to Afghanistan. <laughs> And so now I'm told that I'm going to be late by four days. What am I going to do? I can't just email my family and be, hey, want to let you know I'm going to be home a little late. I'm in Afghanistan. My stomach sank. My heart sank. And I got depressed. I got angry. I didn't want to be there anymore. I didn't want to be there. It's not a fun place. You feel tension. Everybody is armed. Everybody walks around with a sidearm or an M4 on their chest. Sitting in the cafeteria is horrible. You see these soldiers sitting there eating, and it's a large room filled with people, the chow hall, and yet it's not that loud, it's not that noisy. You would expect a chow hall to be very noisy, and it's not. And I hated the chow hall. We had three meals there, a dinner, a breakfast, and a lunch, and I hated the chow hall because you can feel the tension and the stress in the room. Some of these guys were sitting there, they were probably doing who knows what the few days before, and this was their only private time, I hated it. And I didn't want to be there anymore. I didn't know if there was going to be another rocket attack, and you start to get paranoid. I started to imagine that the next rocket attack that was going to hit directly where I was sleeping. And I became a total bastard. I started treating people like dirt. I started talking down to people. The PA officer said, there's a plane that's going to Kyrgyzstan, but we can't get you on it because you don't have the right visa. To which my response was, you get me on that plane. I don't talk to people like that. And I was talking to him like that. And I could hear it coming out of my mouth. I was becoming that person that we hate, the person that we've all worked for who treats everybody like dirt. That was me. And I could feel it. And I hated who I was becoming. I cared about one thing and one thing only, myself. I wanted out. I wanted to be happy. I wanted to be comfortable. And I couldn't care who else had to suffer to get me to that place. Now, I talk about purpose and happiness for a living, and I could feel myself going into this place. And so I started Victor Frankling myself. You know, Victor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, said, we cannot control the circumstances that happen around us. All we can control is our attitude. So I'm like, great, Simon, change your attitude. Think positive thoughts. You know, you can't control your circumstances, so change your attitude. To which my exact response to myself was, go fuck yourself. <laughs> As it turns out, when you're really in a bad place and somebody says to you, change your attitude, you know, is pretty much the response you have to them. It wasn't working. I was still angry and I was still selfish. The three of us walked back to our housing. None of us had slept for more than two and a half or three hours for the past three or four days. And I just lay on my bed and I closed my eyes. I couldn't sleep because my mind was racing, but I just closed my eyes. One of the guys I was with said, I'm going to the gym. The other one said, I'm going to see if I can get us on another flight. And they left. And they thought I was sleeping because my eyes were closed. And so as they walked out of the room, they turned off the lights and they left. And that's when I realized what I was experiencing in this short period of time, the intensity of what I was experiencing was equivalent to someone's entire life. I felt what it was like to be in a dead-end job, where you have moments of joy and moments of excitement, and you hang on to those, and you go, wow, what a, I, I love my life, I love my job, but when you come home at the end of the day, you get into bed, and you hate yourself, and you hate your life, and you hate everything about it, 
and you hope for those little moments of joy to try and convince yourself that you're actually happy. That's how I felt. I was living an entire life in, these compressed, in this compressed period of time. I was depressed. I had completely lost my sense of purpose. And here I am, I was reminding myself, I know what my why is, inspire people to do the things that inspire them. But I wasn't there with any purpose. I had no reason to be there. I was an observer. I had no reason to be there. I had no purpose. I tried to invent one. I tried to back into one. You're here to learn. You're here to see. You're here to tell their story, to go back home and tell their story. It didn't work. I was backing into it. I was making things up. And as much as I could try to convince myself that that was a purpose, it wasn't a purpose. And I sighed. I, I cried. I didn't want to be there. And then I made a decision. If I had to be stuck there for four days, I was going to make myself valuable. If I had to be there against my will, I was going to serve. I was going to volunteer. I was going to go offer if I could speak anywhere, any time that they wanted me. I was going to go meet those people, that go back to the people that I had met and ask them if they wanted me to do anything. Sweep floors, carry boxes. I wanted to serve those who served others. That was my decision. That's how I was going to spend the next four days. Instantaneously, I felt fine. I felt completely fine. I felt relaxed. I was eager and had no issue and didn't mind at all that I was going to be stuck in this war zone for four days as long as I was serving those who were serving others. It was perfect, serene, beautiful. I'd found a purpose. As if it were a movie, as soon as I came to that realization and found peace, the door swung open. Captain Throckmorton rushes in and says, we're leaving. I got us on a flight. Let's go. We have to go now. The plane is leaving. It's a redirected flight. We're leaving now. Where's Matt? I'm like, he went to the gym. He's like, we got to go now. Where's Matt? I'm like, he went to the gym. So we got out and we run to the gym. We grab him off his treadmill. He doesn't have time to shower. He has to take off his PT gear, put on his uniform. We're out of here. We fill up our packs. We put them on and we start rushing out. We're rushing out towards our aircraft. And unfortunately, there was a fallen soldier ceremony that was happening. And we didn't want to get stuck in it for fear that we would miss our plane that was leaving now. And so we sort of did one of these very quick before it got started. But the fallen soldier ceremony had began just as we arrived at the flight line, and the flight line shuts down. Everything shuts down when they have fallen soldier ceremonies out of respect. Nothing happens until the ceremony is complete. And so we stood there at the guard gate. They wouldn't let us onto the flight line yet until the fallen soldier ceremony was completed. And at that point, I told my now friends what I experienced in that room by myself. And I cried as I told them how I was ready to vote, devote myself to the sense of service. And only when I was willing to serve those who served others did I find peace of mind. I, I, it was overwhelming for me. I just cried. And this is the one thing that many people don't know about the military. Crying is fine. It is totally fine, and nobody bothers you. And it's totally acceptable. In fact, they make you feel safe. The fallen soldier cer ceremony was complete. The guard opened up the gate and allowed us to go up to our plane. What I didn't tell you is the reason that this aircraft was redirected. The mission that we would be getting on is we would be carrying home the soldier that they just had the ceremony for. This was not in our itinerary. This was not planned. We boarded the empty C-17. There was no cargo on it. And it's a huge, big cargo plane, empty. And we stood at the back as the back door was open and waited. The casket had not arrived yet. And finally, the Army brought him aboard the flag drape casket, and they all stood at attention in a perfect line. And I put my hand on my heart because I'm a civilian, you know, and I felt like an idiot. And so I looked at them and I stood at attention with them. It just seemed appropriate. And we just stood there in a perfect line as the army carried in this flag drape casket and laid it in the middle of this empty cargo bay. They saluted very, very slowly, marched off the aircraft, and then we could watch them crying and hugging each other as they walked out of sight. At that point, we all cried. The crew did their job, and they strapped the casket into place. And we were going to be the only three passengers aboard this aircraft, us and the crew and our precious cargo. And that was it. And here I was, having just discovered what it means to have a sense of purpose, to serve those who serve others, now I have the honor 
of escorting somebody who gave his life for that same very reason. On every other mission I flew of the total five missions, I hung out with the crew, I sat in the cockpit, it was a wonderful time. On this mission, I never visited the cockpit once. Didn't talk to anybody, none of us talked. It was a very quiet time. And we pulled down our little fold-down seats on the sides of the C-17 and we sat down and I stared at the flag-draped casket as we took off. It was a nine and a half hour flight to get to Ramstein. It was an overnight flight. And so as soon as we were in the air, we pulled out our sleeping bags, we blew up our air mattresses, we all staked out a piece of real estate in the aircraft, and we went to sleep, or at least we tried to. And I slept that far away from a 34-year-old soldier, wife, and three kids as we brought him home. I'm immensely grateful for the experience that I had in Afghanistan because I learned what it means to have purpose. It's not about these big lofty goals that we have when we talk about our business purpose. It's about serving those who serve others. Not serving everyone, serving those who believe what we believe. I spent time with a three-star general, recently a Marine Corps general, and he said to me, the cost of leadership is self-sacrifice. The cost of leadership is self-interest, I mean. The cost of leadership is self-interest. You are not a leader because you own the company. You are not a leader because everybody reports to you. You are not even a leader because you make tons of money. You're a leader when you decide that the people you serve are your employees. I asked him to sum up the Marine Corps, why they're such a remarkable organization. I asked him to sum it up in one sentence. And you know what he said to me? Officers eat last. We put ourselves first, because we think that we've deserved it. We think that we've worked for it. We think that we're entitled to it. Officers eat last. If you want your employees to be completely devoted to you and your cause, you have to be completely devoted to them. Everybody wants to go home feeling fulfilled by their lives, and they come to you. What makes you a leader is that you give them a sense of purpose, and the purpose that you give them is you demonstrate and show them what it means to serve. Those five days in Afghanistan profoundly, profoundly changed me. The final mission we flew from Ramstein home was an aeromedical mission when we flew 37 wounded warriors home. One Marine in critical condition. His friend stood on an IED and blew himself up and died, and he took the shrapnel. Two broken legs, two broken arms, shrapnel in the chest, shrapnel in the face, broken eye socket, punctured eyeball. He was kept in an artificial coma as we went, a coma as we went back, and I tried to avoid him the, sort of the whole flight. It was uncomfortable to see his broken body like that. And finally, I went up to one of the doctors, and he was so excited to talk to us. And it was amazing how he actually broke out a PowerPoint <laughs> and gave us a presentation of all the amazing innovation that was happening because of these missions, that our trauma care as civilians is getting profoundly better because of these young Marines and soldiers who are giving their lives. That's how much it comes back and filters to us. It's not just that they're giving to their country, they're giving right back to us by suffering and that they've learned new techniques to look after these trauma patients. I asked the doctor, I said, he's a reservist who also works in, the, in an ER back home, back here. And I said, I have a strange question for you. I have a strange question for you. Do you have a different sense of fulfillment when you serve these missions than when you're back home working in the ER? I mean, you serve people every day. You look after people who are hurt and wounded. Is it the same or is it different? To which he replied, are we off the record? You always know it's going to be good when they start that way. And I said, yeah, we're off the record. He said, 90 to 95% of the patients that come through in an ER are either drunks or idiots. Easily, 90 to 95% are drunks or idiots. That's who comes into the ER. He said, there's not a single drunk or idiot here. He says, the sense of fulfillment I have is overwhelming because I get to serve people who serve others. This is what it means to lead. If you want to lead, look after your people. Put them first, treat them like family. Don't distinguish between a customer or an employee. They are people. Call them all people. Don't say, I care about my customers. Say, I care about people. And if you hold yourself to the standard of caring about people, you will treat your people and you will treat your customers equally. It's racism to divide them. Why would we have a different standard for an employee versus a customer? That's called racism. They're human beings. 
and our world will not improve, we will not have senses of fulfillment, and we will not wake up every day inspired to do what inspires us unless we feel confident that someone else is looking after us. Every single one of you looks after people, not just your families, every single day. Officers eat last. Thank you very much.